This is going to be Genesis chapter 12, and I want to talk about the subject of let God make something out of you. In Genesis 12, 2 through 3, he says to Abraham, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So God was going to make something of Abraham. And I want to go through the chapter, and if the Lord is going to make something out of you, then you are going to have to leave some things behind. In Genesis 12, 1, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I'm sure you are familiar with the name Abraham, more so than you are Abram. But we're looking at this man Abram, whose name later is changed to Abraham. Because Abram, that name means high father. Now, Abraham is a humble guy, so high father doesn't really suit him. It might suit a lot of people. But he was a humble guy. Abraham means father of nations. That suits him a lot better because he is going to become the father of nations. Now, Genesis 12, 1. Now, the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. So, Abraham, he had to leave some things behind. He had to leave his country, his kindred, and his father's house. Now, his father, Terah, was an idol worshiper, according to Joshua 24, 2. And if Abraham was going to let the Lord make something out of him, then he was going to have to leave some things behind, even if it meant he should leave his father behind. And this is why the Lord didn't want to start anything with Tira. But it seems that Tira took the family and, and Abraham, and they had left Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan back in Genesis 11, but they stopped in Haran. If you look at Genesis 11:31. It says, And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, and his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from the Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So Abram didn't leave Haran until after the death of Terah. As it says in Acts 7, 2-4, through 4, it flat out tells you that then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt and dwelt in Tehran, which is Haran, and from thence when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. So we see that Abraham didn't even leave Haran until after Terah died. And there was some things that Abraham didn't need to take along with him, and that was Terah. That's why he didn't make progress until Terah died. And when I got saved, I determined that I was going to leave some things behind. I remember having about a thousand CDs, and I took them to the trash can and just got rid of them. I mean, somebody suggested I sell them. But I mean, why would I sell something uh, that was keeping me from the Lord that's just going to keep somebody else from the Lord? You know, that's kind of dumb. But when you give up drugs, are you going to sell the remaining drugs to your friends? And that doesn't make too much sense. I wasn't able to drop every sin that I had when I first got saved, but I determined to leave some things behind me. I determined to quit cussing. For me, personally, this was the easiest thing to stop. I mean, my heart was softer. I changed my music. I dumped the movies, and I wasn't around cussing so much anymore. It made it, made it a lot easier to leave it behind me. If Abraham wasn't going to be around Terah and his idols anymore... Even though that's his father, it, it would be easier for him to dump, dump the idols that he might have had. Abraham had to leave some things behind. He had to leave his home and go to be a stranger in a strange land. In this sense, he pictures Jesus Christ. In John 1.14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ was made flesh. He came down and he dwelt among us. 
And 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The Lord left heaven and came down in the flesh to a strange place. He left home to go to a strange place. Abraham had to leave some things behind and he obeyed God, so he reaps what he sows. In Genesis 12.2 the Lord tells him, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So the first thing we see that he says to Abraham, he's going to make of him a great nation. I mean, Israel is still here today, and God will give the, his seed, their land, in the millennium as well. In Zechariah fourteen sixteen through 17, it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth into Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So Jesus Christ is going to reign on the earth from Jerusalem. And the nations are going to come to see him and worship him there. So the Lord is going to make such a great nation out of Abraham that it's even going to be here in the millennium. And he told Abraham, he said, I will bless thee. In Malachi 3.12, it says, And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. He told Abraham, I will make thy name great. And Abraham's name is mentioned 74 times in the New Testament in 70 verses. And just about anybody today is familiar with the name Abraham. And he told Abraham, Thou shalt be a blessing. So he's going to be blessed. And he's going to be a blessing. Abraham is a blessing to even me because God used his seed to give us the scriptures. You have a Bible written by Jews. Abraham is a blessing to me because from his line Jesus came down in the flesh. Genesis 12, 3, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This is true even at the end of the tribulation. You see in Matthew 25, at the judgment of the nations, that the Lord is judging them based on how they treated the Jew. It seems like you have a lot of men today that jump at every chance they have, to badmouth the Jew. Now, I know they are wicked, and I know they're Christ rejectors, but Paul called them beloved enemies in Romans 11. A Christ rejecting Jew goes to hell just like anybody else. And the sins of the Jews today doesn't change the promise given to Abraham. The promise given to Abraham is not conditioned upon obedience of them. I mean, there's going to be a believing remnant of Jews that that go in to possess the millennium. Abraham's going to be there. David's going to be there. The Lord's going to reign on the throne. And I mean, we're not, the church doesn't replace Israel in the sense of us getting their land. We get in on it. We get to reign over some stuff too. But in the sense of getting a physical land, it's still going to Israel. Obviously, not Christ rejecting Israel. Obviously, those people in Israel today that are Christ rejectors, they're going to hell. But there is, God's not done with Israel. And the fact that they're living so wickedly now today doesn't change God's promise to Abraham. In Genesis 12, 4, it says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And that's the next thing. If, if the Lord's going to make something out of you, you're going to have to forget about your handicaps. It said in that verse, Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. Uh, he was already an old man. And I was talking to a friend the other day who thinks he is old at the age of 41. 41 is young. I mean, the Christian life isn't like professional sports. I mean, in the NBA, they think you're old when you're 34. The Christian life isn't like that. I hardly listen to a preacher under 62. And that guy is 20 years younger than most of the preachers I listen to. 20 years or 30 years plus. 
Even if you're 75 and living on borrowed time, you could still live until you're 95. That's 20 years. Set out to do something for God at 75 years old, and someone might say, well, it was different for Abraham because they lived longer back then. They did live longer, but Abraham was still considered old. He was considered old way before he got to be 175, and that is why the birth of Isaac was such a miracle. That is why Sarah laughed about her and Abraham having a child together. Because in Genesis seventeen seventeen it says, And Abram, Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? So Sarah was considered old at ninety. I mean, it's... They were living a long time, but they're still considered old at 75. Yet Abraham was just getting started at 75. If you're ever going to allow the Lord to make something out of you, then you're going to have to just quit focusing on your handicaps and just do it already. Abraham obeyed by going and doing what the Lord said, but he disobeyed in some ways by taking some people with him that he wasn't supposed to, he took a lot with him. In verse 4, it says that Lot went with him. He was supposed to leave Lot. Sometimes you create your own handicaps that God didn't give you. Sometimes you disobey and it just adds extra weight to your load. In Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You're just adding a backpack full of weights. That pet sin you have in your life is like adding extra weight to your load. Lot ends up in Sodom. Abraham takes a lot with him and Lot ends up in Sodom. Lot ends up being taken captive and then Abraham has to come save him. Lot ends up having children with his own daughters and from that relationship comes the Ammonites and Moabites, both of which were enemies to Abraham's descendants. You see how just one little instruction that you don't follow has such a horrible consequence. And even though you have sinned and it's brought an extra handicap in your life, you still have to put the past behind and you move forward. You can't just keep wallowing in your own misery and letting all your handicaps hold you back. And the next thing is, if God is going to make something out of you, you can't forget your responsibilities. In Genesis 12, 5, And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and, all, and, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Abraham had to leave a lot behind. However, he wasn't supposed to leave Sarah behind. He took her with him. And when you're... I mean, while you're allowing the Lord to make something out of you, you can't forget your responsibility in this life. Sometimes you can be studying when you're supposed to be giving your wife attention. If you have taken a wife, you can abandon her and justify it by saying you're always out doing the Lord's work. Christian women need to be there for their husbands and the men for their wives. While you serve the Lord, you need to take them with you. You can't forget about your responsibilities this is my opinion here, but I don't think it's good for a man to leave his wife for long periods of time over the years, even if it's to be doing the Lord's work. I mean, that's my opinion. You may have a different one, but in this day and age, if a man leaves his wife and goes off somewhere for months at a time, their whole marriage, then you're asking for trouble. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says, Defraud ye not one the other. Except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. I just don't personally believe in long absences from each other. That's a, a consistent thing that happens a lot. In Deuteronomy 24, 5, it says, When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business. But he shall be free at home one year, and shall cheer up his wife which he hath taken. I mean, I'm just not seeing where it's a good thing to just leave your wife or your husband and just go off doing a, a job or 
uh, even if you're saying it's for the Lord. In Mark 10, 7, it says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Another thing is that I've always thought it was crazy for a man to leave his wife at home and go hang out with a bunch of other men all the time. I mean, if you just wanted to hang out with the boys all the time, then you shouldn't have gotten married. That's my opinion again. And my opinion isn't worth much. I know that. I, that's why I don't really give my opinion a lot. But I just never understood these bromances some of the men have going on where they're just just so in love with their man friends and calling them and talking to them on the phone for hours and everything else. I mean, y'all ain't like Jonathan and David. They weren't beer buddies. They weren't each other's wingman for the club. I mean, if, the, if you want the Lord to make something out of you, you can't just forget about your responsibilities that you have taken for yourself in this life. And if the Lord's going to make something out of you, you need close close fellowship with the Lord. In Genesis twelve six through 8, And Abram passed through the land into the place of Sychem, and to the plain of Mori. And the Canaanite was then in the land, and the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence into a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west. Bethel means... House of God, house of bread, and Hai on the east. Hai means heaps of ruin. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Notice that where Abraham goes, he builds an altar unto the Lord, and the Lord appears unto him. In both places there he built an altar. An altar is where he would offer sacrifices to God. Abraham was a man of sacrifice. If you're in close fellowship with God, then you also sacrifice some things. As we already said, you leave some things behind. However, you also need to offer your bodies. In the sense that every morning when you get up, you need to determine that everything you do with your body is going to honor God. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. The altar we think of today is a place of praying. Every morning when you get up, pray, and call upon the name of the Lord, just like Abraham did. God can't make anything out of someone who refuses to contact him. If God talked to you through your cell phone, you would have a thousand voicemails that you've neglected to listen to, and a thousand text messages that only say delivered on God's end, because you refuse to open them up and read them. God has delivered you the messages. He wants you to talk back. If God's going to make something out of you, don't go to the world for help. Now keep in mind that Abraham is a new saint at this time and not aged in the faith. He may be an older man, but he's not aged in the faith. We see that he makes a mess of things here just like a babe in Christ will make a mess of things today. In Genesis 12, 9, and Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Notice he is going south. This is a picture of him going away from God who is north, as it says in Psalm 48, 2. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Genesis 12, 10, and there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there. For the famine was grievous in the land. So Abraham packed up and went to Egypt because he was running out of food. Now take note that this is the first time that Egypt shows up in the Bible. And it is not placed in a good light here. So the law first mentioned here sets the tone for Egypt. You'll notice that Egypt is a type of, a, of the sinful world and puts saints in bondage. You'll notice throughout the Bible that Egypt is talked about negatively. For example... Egypt is known for baby killing in Exodus one twenty two. They enslave people, Exodus one eleven through fourteen. They practice idolatry, Joshua twenty four fourteen. They attack Judah, first Kings fourteen twenty five through twenty six. God forbids Isaac to go there, Genesis twenty six three. God has to deliver Israel from Egypt, Exodus twelve forty through forty three. God doesn't want kings buying horses there, Deuteronomy 17, 16. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help, Isaiah 31, 1. Egypt is called an iron furnace in Deuteronomy 4, 20. It's called a house of bondage in Exodus 13, 3. 
Jesus is called out of Egypt, Matthew 2.15. Notice that when Abraham gets to Egypt, it doesn't mention him building an altar to the Lord either. Those other places, he built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. But in Egypt, he wasn't being a testimony. Egypt is the top of the world. Abraham went out there in Egypt and he lost his testimony. He probably isn't living wicked but he's not leaving a testimony there like he did at other places. He's just blending in. That's what a lot of Christians are doing. They're just blending in. Abraham doesn't turn out better by going into Egypt. And you'll notice that he suffers from it. His family suffers from it. And his testimony suffers from it. Genesis twelve eleven. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarai his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Now, Genesis seventeen seventeen showed us that Sarai is 10 years younger than Abraham, who was already 75 back in Genesis 12, 4. So we know that Sarai is somewhere past 65, at least. She must be good looking for her age or something. I mean, Abraham was a wealthy man, so maybe he got her the best wrinkle cream money could buy. Maybe she stayed on the keto diet. I guess everywhere they went, she had somebody checking her out. But he was worried sick that these men was going to be all up on her when they got there. And in Genesis twelve twelve it says, Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. So Abraham is worried that he is in Egypt. And the men will steal his wife away from him and kill him. And this pictures Christians today who are worried that the world are people in this world can take away the promise of God from them because Abraham was promised something. He was promised a seed. God was going to fulfill that promise and Abraham had to be around for that promise to be fulfilled so he was not going to die in Egypt. This should have let Abraham know that God wasn't going to allow the Egyptians to kill him. Many times Christians think that this world can take our salvation. Uh, we think that it can take away what matters most, but Paul tells us in Romans eight thirty eight through 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can take it away. And nothing could have took Abraham's life until God fulfilled that promise. In Genesis twelve thirteen it says, Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. So Abraham wants Sarah to tell a lie. He wants her to tell everyone that she is his sister. This is a half-truth, because she was his half-sister. I bet you didn't know that. Sarai was Abram's half-sister. In Genesis 20 and verse 12, it says, And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Now, don't get worked up about this. Abraham is not a hillbilly from Tennessee like me. Back then, it wasn't wrong to take your half-sister. It didn't actually become a sin until Moses gave the law on it, specifically in Leviticus 18. But this shows me that a half-truth is still a lie. She was his sister, that was true, but he left out the fact that she was his wife too. I mean, I bet they was doubly fighting sometimes. You know how you can't get along with your sister and sometimes you can't get along with your wife? I bet they was really fighting. But this picture is born-again believers who make up the bride of Christ, going out into the world and lying about who their husband is. Sarai went in there and said, No, he's not my husband. That's my brother. I mean, have you ever been around a bunch of people and pretending that you weren't a Christian or just didn't speak up? You're lying about who your husband is. You are the bride of Christ. In Genesis twelve fourteen, and it came to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. This is where you get the saying, my fair lady. Genesis twelve fifteen, the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and committed her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. They must have, they must have said, whoa, she's looking good. She must be a cougar or something. So they took her into Pharaoh's house, thinking, well, she's just his sister. So they thought she was a good-looking woman. They took her in, 
In Genesis 12, 16, he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. So Abraham is entreated well for her sake. So since Pharaoh has the hots for Sarai, he's taking care of Abram. He's taking care of her brother, giving him stuff. This pictures how it literally pays to be a sellout. At least for a while there is pleasure in sin for a season. The devil will pay you to serve him for a while. The world will give you stuff for a while. He entreated Abram well for her sake. You give the world something, it's going to give you something for a while. Genesis twelve seventeen. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. This pictures how the Lord would eventually plague the other Pharaoh of Egypt through Moses and Aaron. And this is a picture of what is to come between Israel and Egypt. Abraham is the father of all those people that would be in bondage in Egypt in the book of Exodus. Genesis twelve eighteen. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? One of the worst things that can happen to a saint is getting rebuked by a lost man. Here Abram is getting rebuked by Pharaoh, a heathen, a heathen. And I don't know if there is any greater sting than getting rebuked by somebody like this. I mean, I'm on my best behavior around a lost man. They're always looking for me to stumble so that they can say, Hey, man, I thought you was a Christian. One time, one time I said, Oh, man. Something happened. I said, Oh, man. And these lost guys thought I said, Oh, blank. But I didn't say, Oh, blank. I was... I mean, I, I, I said, no, I didn't say that. I, I, I said, oh, man. But, I mean, I was tore up for that day and praying, Lord, please let them believe me that I didn't cuss like that. I mean, that just t tears me up. I mean, I think they believe me, but, you know, people's looking for me to mess up because they want to use me as an occasion to blaspheme. They want to use me to say, uh, see, these people, they claim to believe in this God, and they are a bunch of hypocrites. I don't want to be that person that they're using. Genesis twelve nineteen, Pharaoh's like, Why saidest thou she is m my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. This pictures Pharaoh eventually letting Israel go because of the plagues. Genesis twelve twenty, And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. They obviously didn't belong there. And I'm not hard on Abraham because of what he did. I might have done worse in his situation. Although I have a history of becoming extremely rageful over my wife. When somebody flirts with my wife, it's the closest I get to losing my testimony. I mean, I might be the opposite on Abraham on this one. But this has been Genesis chapter 12. Let the Lord make something out of you. Get up and do what you're supposed to do. Leave some things behind that you know you're not supposed to have. Forget your handicaps. Forget about those things you're so depressed about that's holding you back. Your age, your wife, your kids, your whatever it is that you think's holding you back. Just get up and do it. But don't forget your responsibility. You can't forget your wife. You can't forget your kids. You have to take care of them. If you're the man of the house, you've got to take care of your family. Be in close fellowship with the Lord. Read your Bible. Pray. Quit putting gunk in your mind. Don't go to the world for help. Don't think that the world can help you better than God.